Well, I think that it's, it's come down to looking at systems for delivering uh, infrastructure and services to people, and not just the infrastructure and services that kind of pe people are assumed to need in a technocratic sense, but the infrastructure and services that people want. So what these systems ultimately come down to, and by system kind of organizations, processes, practices, uh, means of communication, I think over the past 10, 11 years now actually working on these kind of systems for infrastructure and services, it's come down to information flow. And within the city context, it's very interesting because what you see in cities in India is there is much more potential due to kind of the concentration of access to IT, the access to cell phones, the increasing wealth in cities for a completely different kind of dialogue between citizen and state. Unfortunately, India has gotten very far in um, technology in a technical sense, in a programming sense, and in a um, in an, a sense that has been abstra very abstracted from usage. And I think that's actually been damaging for looking at the role of technology within an organization um, and user-focused, the, uh, the understanding that technology imposes a certain order and a hierarchy that ends up being reflected in human work process. And that you can use technology in some sense to um, achieve institutional and governance reform simply by specifying ro user roles in, uh, say, a complaints management system, um, and that that potential has not, been, has not been fully realized. The other sort of way I see technology is as kind of the hub of a communication system that has to extend offline. So there may be sort of a central clearinghouse among those who are connected to the internet or connected to a, now a cell phone to connect to the internet, but that information has to be capable of, of skipping over the person who's connected to people who are within two or three degrees of being connected. And that, from an information systems design perspective, is a really exciting question, because it says you don't need to get your information sort of organized for electronic dissemination, but you have to think, how is somebody going to print it? How is somebody going to broadcast this over the radio? Um, and, and it's conquering those questions where I think that technology will really fully be technology for development. So there are a lot of constraints. I mean, I think on, a, on an institutional level, um, there's, the, there's the minor constraint of, of, of you know, tendering for e-governance systems. Um, the tenders, in order to write a tender to produce a system that is organizationally sensitive, one already has to have kind of a combination of the, the knowledge of the solution sets, the knowledge of the things that technology can do, along with the knowledge of the problem set. So one has to be a sort of a practitioner. And we don't have people who have, we, there, there aren't that many people um, anywhere in the world, um, I mean, even here or there are other, other elsewhere, who have both the solution and the problem set in their, in their heads and can fully envision the, poss the possibilities in order to write the tender to build the systems. Um, so that, that's one big issue. Um, another big issue, I think, is that the, uh, there's been too much focus on a very mundane form of digital divide, which is simply access to being able to touch a piece of technology and not as, a, as a, um, a canyon in which information can fall. And once you look into that canyon, you think, what are the, I mean, I'm trained as an economist, so I think of incentives. What are the incentives for people to push information into the system, and what are the incentives to pull it out? Because they will figure out how to touch a piece of technology if you create the incentives for them to want to pull the information. And that perspective, I think, has been lost in a lot of the development dialogue about digital divide being a physical access question. It's in some sense a question of pricing because this, this kind of, these kinds of questions have been addressed in the private sector very effectively in the for-profit private sector. And they're, but they're starting to be addressed in the not-for-profit sort of third sector more and more effectively. And I think within the government there's more and more sort of tech savviness. I mean, uh, I did one study, for example, in Karnataka cities looking at the adoption of, of e-governance. Um, and the level of sophistication of, of user suggestions on how to improve the system. And in the first year, people were asking for um, more hardware, the typical, you know, I want another computer, I want another uh, cell, cell phone, whatever else. By the third or fourth year, the conversations that were happening were about informa information routing, privacy access, um, user control, which is a very, which says to me that this set of problem set and solution sets are starting to come together. So you can have user-driven innovation, which I think is the key to 
designing these systems. So I think it's it's incredibly exciting, um, sort of on, on several levels. I mean, one is the the uh, it's the pedagogical level. I mean, I think a lot of the discussion that I've heard has been very focused on producing people who uh, not only know some things, but have a way of thinking and a way of asking questions, which is something that, in, in my experience teaching in the U.S. and in India, um, is not something that's taught well at an undergraduate level, and is something that is just. Um, desperately needs to be teached. I mean, I think around the world. So in that sense, it's an exciting pedagogical experiment. I think on a um, the link between the curriculum and the goals and the sort of the larger uh, integrated view of the process of development is, is equally exciting. The success or failure of reaching these broad goals is going to come down to the micro incentives that, you know, what kind of incentives do faculty face? Uh, what's the faculty ecology? And these are all uh, questions that I think from what I've seen are, are being tackled and thought about in a serious way. It's not another sort of here's a broad goal and then we'll put a bunch of smart people in a room. That these, these micro questions are going to be an example for institutions n definitely not just in India but around the world because no one's quite conquered this yet but it seems that it's on a path to do it. I do think that there are some tough questions about um, sequencing, about where to start with what are the most important things to do first, next, and until 2030, 2050. And, and from what I've heard, there is not, um, there are a lot of great ideas, but it, ultimately there's going to have to be a, a prioritization over time of these great ideas. And I think that's, that's the hardest part, especially when it's been such a consultative process. Um, and I think there are going to have to be some controversial calls taken to exclude very valuable, very necessary, very socially worthy endeavors in order to, to find the niche and do it very well. Um, so that's one. The, the other big challenge is just you know, logistically the constraints of operating in the legal environment. I think uh, meeting the goals within the, uh, within the current context and the, the supply of faculty and students and so on is also going to be challenging.